Broadcasting on the internet airwaves from the great state of Minnesota, my name is Sean and you're listening to The Sean Tabbitt Show. Today, my special guest is Havila Cunnington, and we're discussing her new book, Stronger Than the Struggle, Uncomplicating Your Spiritual Battle, and that's published by my good friends over at Thomas Nelson. Havila, thanks for joining us on today's show. Thank you for having me. This is your first time on the show, Havila, so I want the listeners to get an opportunity to get to know you a little bit. So tell us some of the Havila Cunnington origin story. What are a few of the key things we need to know about you? It's an honor to be on the show, so thank you for inviting me. And for those of those who that don't know me, I have four children. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I have four boys. We had four kids in five years. So we definitely tried to overachieve in that world. And then we also lead a, a nonprofit ministry called Truth to Table, which is an online community that allows, uh, I guess, we create courses and studies that help the believer learn how to walk out complicated things in their everyday life and make them uncomplicated. So that kind of farm to fork, it's truth to table. So we spend our day doing that. And then other than that, we like to take walks at night and, you know, uh, I'm Italian, so I see people because I love people. And so that's really, you know, where, where we are. We live in Redding, California, which is like the northern part of the state. And we're surrounded by mountains, and we are an outdoorsy kind of farm people. Um, and we go to a beautiful church called Bethel Church here. So uh, it's a beautiful life. It's crazy. Four boys are crazy. But most of the time, I, uh, I keep people in, in clean underwear and loving Jesus. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> well, those are all definitely worthwhile pursuits. And, and I can appreciate having that many littles at such a young age. My wife and I have nine children. Although we only have uh, three boys and six girls, but yeah, it's uh, <laughs> never dull and, and always exciting. And I and I can vouch for how wonderful Reading is. If folks ever get a chance to go visit, it's a great town. And Bethel is a special place all into its own. I always encourage people to go there as well. Funny that I've never bumped into you when I've been at Bethel. Maybe next time <laughs> yeah. I might see you well, there. I, I, <laughs> we do travel. We're on the road about two to three times a month, and. Our kids get to go with us. So often I'm in all parts of the world. And so I usually bump into people not in Reading, but other places, which I love. Well, and that's kind of funny that you say that because I travel a lot and go to quite a few conferences. And there are a lot of authors who will say, it will be almost impossible for you to connect with me at home. Just find some place where I'm (laughs) on the road and I can give you 10 minutes of my time there. So apparently that's not too (laughs) uncommon of an experience. It's not. You you want to meet people. (laughs) Yep. Next, let's get into what I like to think of as the story behind the book. I'd be curious, you know, for you, what was that catalyst or that spark that got your mind moving in the direction of the message you crafted for a Stronger Than the Struggle? How did that begin moving or culminating or coming together in your mind? You know, it, it happened many years ago, almost 20, 20 something years ago. I was a, I'm a preacher's kid. My dad was a traveling evangelist and I was my dad was on the road about eight months out of the year, and we were on the road about six months out of the year growing up. And I came from a very uh, a family that was very motivated by the gospel. I loved the ministry, uh, but I struggled with learning disabilities. And from a very early age, I realized something I was different than most people. And by high school, I could not read out loud, and you could not read my handwriting. And I spent the majority of my high school years trying to stay hidden and hoping that nobody would find out how lost I was. And when I gave my heart to Christ at 17, I really did not think he could use me. And that sounds cliche, but I remember telling God, you know, pick somebody else. My brain is not fully formed. I don't have the capacity to really help you other than just maybe serve in an unseen area. And the Lord really, he spoke to my heart and he said, you know, Havala, you know how you felt lost in school all those years? Well, there's a lot of people in church that feel completely lost. And your mandate, your calling is to help uncomplicate things that seem complicated in the church that nobody would feel lost. And so when we took the topic of your spiritual battle, I found that a lot of believers, people of faith, they were confused by that topic. One side of the church was, 
you know, they never talked about the spiritual battle. You know, the enemy was under our feet and it felt scary and out of reach. And maybe there were people, certain people anointed to touch on a topic. And then there are other parts of the body of Christ that were all about here, devil, there, devil, everywhere, devil, devil. It was, you know, you would sneeze in front of them and they would, you know, say, you, you know, be released in Jesus' name. There was this disconnect. And so when I began to study the word, I said, God, I want to know, you know, you said we're stronger than the struggle, but I want to know how. I want to know why. I want to know how. And I, I know that you said in John 10, 10, we're to live an abundant life, but it feels like we're so focused on the enemy being a thief and a killer and a stealer of all of our stuff. How do we live that abundant life? So that's really how this book got birthed, was taking a complicated topic of spiritual warfare, the spiritual struggle, and then complicating it so we can walk it out in everyday life. And you share a lot of personal stories in the book, so I'm going to throw you kind of a unique question. I'm curious to see how you answer it. I'd be curious to hear how your perspective on spiritual warfare has shifted over time. So if, if you could answer this maybe from the lens of experiences and, and seasons of life. So uh, you gave us a little bit of perspective on how this journey started, where this message got its start, but experience-wise and understanding of spiritual warfare, what did that maybe look like, say, in your 20s and in your 30s? Like, uh, what's the progression you've experienced just in, in life and ministry, if you had to express it in those stages? Yeah, I, I would have said that spiritual warfare was very intimidating and confusing, specifically as a young believer. And I remember going back to one instance where I was at a camp setting and there was a girl during worship that began to manifest like a a demonic manifestation. Now, I just assumed that's what it was because I had heard stories about it. I'd never seen it. And at that point, the leaders in the room told us as the group to turn around, hold hands, but face outward and don't look at what's happening in the center of this prayer moment with this girl because they said, you know, we don't want to give the enemy attention. And so we turned around, we held hands and began to pray. You know, we weren't sure there was kind of some screams and shrieks in the middle of the room. And then they kind of carried her out of the room and they went on with this service and the next day never said another word. And I remember us going to bed that night as a team and there was no one talked about it, but the message was so clear, which was, we can't talk about it. It's too scary. And there's only certain people that are anointed to talk about spiritual warfare, and you're not one of them. <laughs> so, so mind your business. Don't give the enemy any attention and keep going. And when it came to spiritual warfare in my 20s, I was very confused about it, intimidated. I assumed you had to have an anointing for it. And as I've gone now, I'm in my 40th year. I've really learned that spiritual warfare is really an active lifestyle of being aware of the battle that we live in, the daily struggle that we often face, but living in a place of strength, not in a place of defense, but a place of offense. So it's really about understanding our enemy, recognizing his tactics, how he operates in our life without fear, without anxiety, but identifying it and dealing with him as quickly as possible to get on with living the life that we're called to live. And I just see too many believers. I spent too much of my time focused, uh, giving the enemy too much credit for things that he should have been dealt with very quickly and reminded of his place that he is under our feet and he has no power. And I think I just spent too much time wondering how to have that authority. I really resonated with what you said earlier. On the one hand, I think there uh, is a part of the church where there's kind of a, a demon under every rock, and there's maybe the opposite extreme where there's zero awareness that there's any kind of warfare going on around them. So maybe give us a, a little bit of guidance. You know, when we bump up against barriers, difficulties, how can we discern what we're dealing with? Because sometimes it could be an internal struggle, an internal battle. Maybe sometimes it's resistance from God kind of holding us back from something. And other times it might be a a genuine fight with the devil, if you will. So how do we discern which of those scenarios or situations we're dealing with? Sure. It's such a great question. I think part of the, the heart behind the book was that many of us believers, when we come against or face a struggle in our life, we are faced with the question, is this God, myself, or the devil? And depending on who it's coming from, it's kind of our action plan. You know, we don't want to resist what God's putting us through, and we definitely want to resist the enemy. And then if it's ourselves kind of perpetuating something critical in our life, then how do we focus on that? And so 
I spent a lot of my energy in the book defining the enemy, how he talks to us, how he operates, what his characteristics are. So when it comes to our relationship with Christ, we know, wait a minute, God would never talk to me like that. God would never set me up like that. It's coming in a spirit of anxiety or fear, or it's a performance driven, and that's not going to be a healthy place. God would never teach me because I'm his kid. He wouldn't talk to me like that or operate with me like that. So it's really identifying, you know, I love T.D. Jakes. I quote him quite consistently with this topic, but he says, you must understand your enemy for you cannot defeat what you do not understand. And so that's really the premise of this book is really understanding how an enemy operates. And he is a liar. He is a thief. He's coming to destroy the things that God's done within our hearts, no matter how powerful or, or maybe dynamic we feel like our lives are. Ultimately, if we're God's kid, then we possess life that he will never have. And so really identifying that struggle. So we spend a lot of time in the book in the beginning identifying his characteristics. And then we spend some time in the book talking about why we face struggles. And part of it is that we just live in a really broken world. We live in a world where the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. So some of that is just part of living on this earth and living in a broken world. And then there are seasons where we think about Jesus calling the disciples into the storm. There are seasons where God takes us into the storm. But often in those storms, He is with us. The Bible talks about when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. The Bible doesn't say He delivers us from that, but He walks with us. So how do we stay connected to Him? And then how do we live out our everyday life? And when we face a struggle, how do we live in such authority that we deal with the enemy quickly? And if it is something God's teaching us, we're going to know that. So we unpack all of that in this new book. I'm really excited about it. I'm just, I want everyone to, to read this because it's really been a labor of love to unpack this complicated topic. It shouldn't be complicated. This shouldn't be something that we're scared to talk about. You're not going to find, it's not a spiritual warfare manual. I mean, it's really kind of an everyday unpack your struggle kind of book that really takes from my own life some of the struggles I faced myself and unpacked it. So it should be like we're having a conversation about this, and I cannot wait for your listeners to get a hold of this book. Well, if you could say define, you might think of it as define a call to action for every reader, or you know, if readers are only going to remember one thing after finishing the book, what's that one thing you hope comes through loud and clear And each and every reader goes forward differently because they're changed in this way. What does that look like? I think spiritual warfare is not for an elite group in the body of Christ. Living as a powerful person in a battle is for every believer. We can live victorious and we can live with a sense of winning in our everyday life, not because of something that we're doing, but because of something that was given to us. So, you know, what I'd like to do is have every believer walk away and no longer be intimidated by the topic of the spiritual battle, but have a game plan, know how to fight it, and know how to live it out. And then when they face a struggle, know how to define the struggle and live powerful in that way. Really, I guess my heart in all of it is, I don't want anyone to walk away feeling like that topic is too scary or too big for them. It is for all of us, and we are all called to be in it and live in it and live in a way that the enemy is under our feet. Well, and one thing I wanted to make mention uh, is that you have, uh, at the end of each chapter, there's a a list of empowerment points that bookends or ends each chapter. From your perspective as the author, how might you see, say, individuals putting those to use or even small groups? I think they would be a real good maybe discussion starter for some small groups as well. So what was your vision for including those and how should people use them? That was kind of a, a addition in the middle of the writing the book. And, you know, I'm a busy person. I have four kids. We run an organization. I am, you know, most of the time I'm kind of meeting God between the wash and the dryer most days. And so I understand that sometimes you can read a whole chapter, but you're not sure what to take away. And so the empowerment points were really a point of focus and to give you an idea of what was the most vital. If you only have five minutes to review what you just read, these are your takeaway points. So I think you can use them for your personal study time with the journal and God and read it, take the questions and, and talk about it with yourself or your roommate or your small group. And then also you can take these books and they're great, easy read chapters and then spend some time weekly, maybe with a Facebook group or uh, in person and discuss some of the stuff that we've talked about. And these empowerment points are great ways to do that. 
So that was really just a way to say, listen, I know your life is busy. Mine is to you. And I need to know what the big deals are. And these are the big deals. Talking to many, many authors over the last six, seven years, I know that each book project is a unique journey. And an author will often emerge on the other side a little bit different or a little change. And I, I think sometimes that's in a sense because, one, we're refining and shaping this message and this experience we've had, but also we're kind of preaching and ministering to ourselves and having to learn to own up to the message that we're sharing with others. So, Havel, I'd be curious to hear for you, how were you shaped or impacted along the journey writing Stronger Than the Struggle? Yeah, it's such a great question. And it's funny when you meet other authors that have written books, you'll say, oh, I'm about to write a book. And they're like, oh, have fun with that. <laughs> and there's this kind of, you know, uh, war-torn look in other authors' eyes that are like, we've all done this. And it's true. I think God in his sovereignty and grace really works a message through in our lives. And for me, you know, I knew this message. I spent years, you know, unpacking the idea of it. But really, when I began to write this book, because I've written um, Bible studies before, multiple Bible studies, but I've never written a full book. And within this book, I really took, I said, you know, after 20 years of serving God and 15 years of ordination and being in ministry, I took all of those stories and just even writing them down in my journey in Christ as a young woman, as a single, just coming of age and serving God to now being a mom and a wife and you know, 40-year-old minister, what was that journey? And so throughout the book, writing those stories, you know, I would even sit back at times and just weep as I would remember the moment God touched my heart about something or spoke to me about something. And, you know, the moment of clarity where I thought, oh, that was the moment everything got clear for me when I read that passage or that part of the commentary. And it just, it was such a, a healing process. It's such a, a moment of sitting back and going, wow, God, you are at work. But also when you you talk about a spiritual battle, I felt like this book, there were many times I would face uh, my own struggles this year, and I would have to put this work into practice and say, okay, you're telling people this is how you define the struggle. Do it yourself. And I'd have to sit back and go, okay, am I saying this is the enemy when really it's me? Or am I saying this this is God and really it's the enemy, you know, picking on me? And really getting clear on that and just, Every time I would write, I felt like I would spend that season, that month, going through that process. So it was very, it was a tough process. It was hard work. You know, it's like labor when we have babies. You know, they don't call it labor for no reason. Labor is because you're about to go to work to have this baby. And I almost want to say writing is that same way. It's that labor of love. It's to get it out, all of that stuff that that was in your heart. And you you desperately want to give, if somebody has a few minutes of their time or your time, you know, written, you've written your, your heart, you, you just want them to hear what you're saying. And all the years of prayer and, and times of, you know, walking with God and struggling and, and wrestling with these huge ideas, you definitely want your reader to get it and hear it from you and not miss a thing. So I've learned a lot. I will do writing totally different next time I come around this mountain, but this one I'm really proud of. And I'm just honored to have written something like this. Havila, if the listeners want to connect with you, and I, I know many of them are going to want to find out more about the book, so where can they find you online? Where are some of the places you hang out? Yeah, you know, they can clearly find me at HavilahCunnington.com, but they can pick up the book at any place that booksellers, you know, sell books. And it's on Amazon and all that good stuff. But I'm on social media at most days. So you can find me on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Um, and then also our ministry called Truth to Table. You, you can find us on Instagram, but mostly HavilahCunnington.com will give you all the information and all the places that we like to hang out. Well, and as we do with every episode, we'll have links in the show notes to places where you can connect with Havila at our website, on social media, as well as places where you can buy the books. You can, once you're done listening to this, uh, just head on over to SeanTabbitt.com, search for Havila, and we'll have all that linked up right there. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Havila Cunnington. Once again, our book today was Stronger Than the Struggle, Uncomplicating Your Spiritual Battle. Be sure to head on over to Havila's website to connect with her, find out more about her ministry and her book and other resources. You can do that at HavilaCunnington.com. And Havila, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It has been a great pleasure speaking with you. It's an honor, really. I had a great time. 
And that's all for this episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion, you can connect with me via email using show at seantabbitt.com. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, where I go by the Twitter handle at stabbitt. And if you enjoy the show, head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. Until next time, this is your host, Sean Tabbitt, signing off. Thank you.